There's a lot of confusion about the oral dosing of methylene blue, and that's because in the literature, they often refer to the intravenous dosing, something we would use in the emergency room for someone with cyanide poisoning or carbon monoxide poisoning. And that dose is given as 0.5 to 4 milligram per kilogram body weight, which is a huge dose, and I never even take close to that orally. But a lot of people look at that and they dose it uh, based on that, and I think that might actually be a mistake. And that is uh, because when we take it orally, uh, one thing we have to keep in mind, part of it is actually going all the way through the digestive tract. And keep in mind, methylene blue is an antibiotic, so it would certainly kill off some bacteria. And if it kills off some of the good bacteria in our gut, we can cause a massive disruption in our gut microbiome. Now, this usually doesn't happen until doses that exceed about 30 uh, milligrams per day. Under that, it's very unlikely that methylene blue will disturb the bacteria in the gut. We also have to keep in mind that methylene blue has an excellent oral absorption. It's somewhere in the order of 80 to 90%, which is extremely rare for any medication. So I would argue, you know, taking it orally or taking it intravenously is, you know, very comparable in this case. Again, keep in mind, though, that taking it orally, again, some of it will go all the way through the digestive tract. That's one of the differences here, right? And when you look at the doses that we need to achieve really its nootropic effect, you know, for brain health, for energy, for uh, concentration functioning and all that, we may really not need excessive doses. I have um, you know, looked at what some people have been taking to just improve their memory, especially elderly patients. So people in their you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. And some of these doses were extremely low, quite surprisingly. Now, again, this is not a big study. These were individuals that were reporting, taking this over several years. And the lowest dose I've seen is someone in the order of two to three milligrams daily, which is a very tiny dose, obviously. <clears throat> and some people would go all the way up to about 20 milligrams a day. Some of the studies that were done that uh, showed that methylene blue had a great effect on preventing or treating uh, dementia, dementia of Alzheimer's type or even dementia of Parkinson's disease, were done around 16 to 17 uh, milligrams. And that dose is something that some manufacturers now are using as a daily dose when it comes to brain health. Other manufacturers go a bit higher. They recommend up to 30 uh, milligrams a day, again, which is, to me, almost on the um, excessive side. Keep in mind, at some point, we might disrupt the gut microbiome, so we have to be a bit cautious there, right? But um, I would always say, uh, and of course, none of this is medical advice, because there's some people that should not take methylene blue, especially if you're pregnant or you have a, you're taking an SSRI, you should be very cautious. Always ask your doctor first. This is a real medication that has real potential side effects. So... Selecting it, first of all, you have to make sure it is pharmaceutical grade. You have to get a good quality methylene blue. Methylene blue is also a dye, and it's used as that. The dye, so the industrial version of this, is full of heavy metals. It's very, very toxic, so you should really not consume that. So you got to make sure it says USP on it, you know. So USP grade or pharmaceutical grade, that's really uh, extremely important. And then you can start with lower doses. Again, not medical advice, as your doctor first, but you can start in very low doses and titrate slowly up. So I started really with about, you know, uh, five milligrams a day, and I'm currently taking between six and 10 milligrams a day. We also have to keep in mind the half-life of methane blue, which is somewhere between five to seven hours. So some people will take it twice a day. For me, I mostly only take it once a day. Keep in mind, this is an average half-life, and this might vary from person to person. Um, so I would usually take methane blue in the morning, somewhere around 9 a.m. And if, you know, on occasion, I would take a second dose around, you know, 1 p.m. or so. I don't take it much later than that. Initially, I dosed it twice a day with the second dose being closer to the evening, and it does disrupt my sleep. Not everybody feels that way. There are some people that report <clears throat> sleeping just fine because it is not exactly a stimulant, even though it can raise heart rate and it can raise blood pressure. So I, I do find it quite activating. I did a short video about this kind of warning about not taking it before workout. I did that at one time, and I definitely had a very significant increase in heart rate and blood pressure and felt lousy. So I think this is not a great um, supplement or medication to take before a workout. I would wait at least two to three hours before training or take it about an hour after. I work out in the morning. So for me, I usually uh, work out first and then take it afterwards. But that's something that's actually very important also to keep in mind. If you have high blood pressure, again, that's why you should talk to your physician about it. You may uh, keep that in mind. You may have to adjust your blood pressure medications. You may have some real issues here was taken methylene blue. It is sometimes used even in the OR to stabilize blood pressure during an operation. So we have indicators that this is something that we can do to influence our blood pressure so it can raise blood pressure, in other words. So then again, half-life of you know five to seven hours, dosing, depending on that. I think taking a once-a-day dose is probably sufficient. Um, but again, you can also take, if your dose, let's say, is somewhere around 10 milligrams, you can take five milligrams at 8 a.m., 
another 500 grams at noon, and that'll really extend it until the late afternoon in terms of its efficacy. Um, it will stain everything it touches. So even if you take it in a tablet form and you keep the tablet on your tongue for too long, it'll stain your tongue very, very blue. The liquid is a, a very, very powerful stain. So in my experience, um, if you have it on your countertop or on your floor, I mean, once it's there, it's <laughs> really hard to remove it if, if you're able to do that at all. Uh, that's something to keep in mind. And you can tell, of course, when you excrete it, most of it will be excreted unchanged in the urine. There's minimal metabolism in the liver. Most of it will come out as, you know, as it came in as regular methylene blue or as leucomethylene blue, especially in the presence of vitamin C. So the leucomethylene blue is clear. And um, some preparations use vitamin C with the uh, methylene blue. And if it's a liquid, the liquid is actually clear. Um, but um, again, it's usually excreted and you can tell in your urine, urine will be greenish blue. You know, that's a sign that you're excreting it. Um, some uh, have people have suggested you can use that sort of as what's your particular half-life. I mean, as long as you that observe every time you use the restroom, if you still have a greenish blue urine, there's probably still significant amounts of math in blue that you are currently using. And this kind of helps you understand your half-life a little bit. I think that's a very crude way to measure it. But again, it's a, a simple thing to do. And we don't really have, uh, you know, you can't just do a blood test easily to, to test how much math in blue is in your system. That would be very complicated to do. So, yeah, so I would always be very cautious in terms of the dosing. I don't think we need a lot of it. It's a hormetic drug. That means in small amounts, it has a certain effect. In high amounts, it might achieve the opposite effect. This is something we can certainly observe in methemoglobinemia. Um, that is essentially where the iron in the heme is changed from its uh, ferrous state to a ferric state, to an oxidized state. And that doesn't allow the proper um, transport of oxygen. It's a very dangerous condition. Now, methylene blue in the right dose can reverse that. So then it actually, you know, helps to take care of this problem. But in very high amounts, it might actually cause it. So that's uh, what the hormetic drug is, you know, in, in low amounts or in appropriate amounts, I should say, it has a certain effect. But when you go above that, then you can have the opposite effect. And that's something to keep in mind. So at low doses, it treats it. At high doses, it might cause it. And this is very important because another contraindication to using methylene blue is a G6PD deficiency which is a glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. It's something that is a, a genetic um, anormality that uh, you either have or you don't. It's nothing that usually changes throughout your lifetime. People of Mediterranean background are more prone to have this. You can do a lab test for a, a G6PD, so again, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme level, and it'll tell you if you are in that range. If you're in range, then you usually will not have problems uh, taking higher amounts of methylene blue Again, I don't think you actually ever need to. This is more for intravenous use again. But um, you can um, rest assured that it has, it doesn't, it will not have this negative effect causing this hemoglobinemia. Now, um, at the doses though that we're talking about here, somewhere between five and 15 milligrams at the very high end, 30 milligrams. Again, this is not official medical advice, but I would really be extremely surprised if even someone with a G6PD deficiency would encounter met hemoglobinemia. However, it's always good to be cautious. And if you are affected by this, then you should talk to your physician. You should always talk to your physician before you're using it anyway. But then you should probably not consider not to use it, essentially, right? Also, what else can cause met hemoglobinemia? For example, high doses of intravenous vitamin C. So we do this in our clinic. And before I start someone on a very high dose um, vitamin C intravenously, we're talking here in excess of about 10,000 milligrams IV and usually go to 50,000 or even uh, 75,000 plus milligrams here. I always test people for a G6PD deficiency. I think that's an important thing to do in those circumstances, right? So yeah, so for dosing again, oral dosing, I think the key points to remember is that it has an extremely high oral absorption amount, 80 to 90%. So you get a lot in, um, half-life five to seven hours. Um, titrate it up slowly if your physician says you're okay to do so. And I would probably start with just like five milligrams. Uh, most of the liquid, that would be about 10 drops. So, so 0 0.5 milligrams per drop. There, there's a tablet form as well. But you really got to read the label. Again, and these very high doses, we're talking 0 0.5 to 4 milligrams per kilogram body weight. This is mostly for conditions treated, you know, in the hospital where we give it intravenously. And I would really shy away from those. I don't think it's necessary for that. Again, even for um, using it preventively for uh, neurocognitive disorders, we're talking Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's disease, 
mostly again 15 to 17 milligrams daily this is not a huge dose i think that's actually very reasonable and this will uh work very well apparently for, for many people so i think it's an amazing um drug i've been using it now for quite a few months i do take breaks on and off again with a half-life of five to seven hours and at the dosing i'm using it doesn't really accumulate in the body however I think it's good with anything to take breaks. And there's an interesting question that came up about this. Am I going to feel the effect when I'm not taking it? Is there withdrawal, right? And usually there's not. That's interesting. So usually you do not develop tolerance. That means you don't have to continue to increase your dose, but also you don't develop withdrawal. So if you stop it, you just stop it. You should not have real negative uh, consequences from that. Um, this can vary, of course, from, from person to person, but in general, I wouldn't worry so much. It is used sometimes in conditions even like ADHD. And there are some companies now marketing it specifically for ADHD. They usually mix in um, a little bit of caffeine and theanine to really give this uh, uh, brain health support. I think this is an interesting approach. Um, ADHD, we think more of children affected by it. Again, for sure, if you use this, talk to, talk to your pediatrician. Most physicians, honestly, may not know about methylene blue, but uh, they can certainly read up on it. I think it's, an, it's very interesting. It should be something that we should be more familiar with if you're treating a geriatric population or potentially a young population with issues like ADHD. But um, I've heard from a couple of my patients that are using it in that respect, you know, and they're saying that it works just as well, if not better, than things like Adderall. Now, Adderall or, you know, all these other uh, stimulants we're using for ADHD these will certainly have um, tolerance. That means after a while, you might have to use more and withdrawal. And these are medications that are highly habit-forming. So comparatively, uh, methylene blue is most likely a safer alternative because it does have cell-protective function. It is not um, habit-forming. And um, again, it's neuroprotective or cell-protective in general because it is very protective of our mitochondria and all the cells of our body. And since it crosses the blood-brain barrier, also in the neurons in our brain. So these are things to keep in mind when you talk to your physician. Um, I think these are all very good indications preventively. My main uh, concern is using it to prevent, uh, you know, <clears throat> cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's disease, all those things. Um, also, I find that it helps me uh, focus and concentrate better. I get more things done and it makes really uh, my day a bit more efficient. Um, but again, take breaks once in a while. I think that's a good idea. Talk to your doctor if you can take it. Keep in mind all the contraindications, the G6PD deficiency, pregnancy, um, take in an SSRI, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, like an antidepressant. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a few others actually. And then you just, you know, keep in mind if that's something that is safe to do. And if you do try so with, you know, after you're consulting your physician, I would always try with a very low dose. Again, I have had comments from several people have that have taken this for years that really have amazing effects at doses as low as two or three milligrams per day.